Get it, get it. Yeah. And welcome to the Dog Show, episode eleven. Here with my good buddy, Mr. Nick White. How are you, sir? What's up? What's up, guys? And we have a couple of special special guests with us today. Um, we were actually supposed to have Jeff Shedler in from Georgia K9. He unfortunately could not make it last minute, had some vehicle issues. But we brought a couple of good friends uh, in studio with us. We have Mr. Mountain. How are you, sir? Good, good. And, uh, and Mr. Jacob Robinson, uh, former Marsock. So, uh, guys, tell me a little bit about yourselves. Jacob? Uh, so I did nine years in the Marine Corps, came in in 2005, um, got lucky enough to get introduced to dogs early on in my career. Did that for nine years, was a Marsock handler for six, uh, handler slash trainer, and then got out, worked at Vomlet Kennels for uh, about a year and a half, and then kind of moved on and now training with Off Leash and the Clarksville location. Yes, sir. Happy to have you on. Uh, Mountain, tell us a little bit about yourself, buddy. So I was also a Marine. Uh, I did 12 years in the Marine Corps Infantry. Few tours over in Iraq and Afghanistan. Last couple in Afghanistan, we actually had the uh, IDD dogs attached to us, so I actually had to give up one of my Marines to go train. I don't remember nine or twelve weeks, something like that, and they came back and cross trained the squad. So we'd go on patrol and we'd employ all those dogs, find those roadside bombs, and uh, did that for two deployments. Got out, wanted to keep working with dogs, and I've been with Off Leash for the last three years. Awesome, yeah, Mountain's a good dude and an awesome trainer. So uh, happy to have him on as well, Mr. White. Yes, how are you? I'm doing well, doing well. I have a nice uh, little break. Yeah, right we had a week travel. off. Yeah, I just got back, uh, what, two days ago. I was teaching, tracking some of our trainers out in Pennsylvania. So uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. I was teaching trainers there. And now I'm just chilling until the first week of April. I'm enjoying the nice break off with seminars. Um, the first week of April, I go out to Sacramento to do UFC Cody Garbrandt's dog, former UFC champion. Dude's a beast. Yeah, he is. And I got that going on. I get back from there. I'm back two weeks, and then I have a private seminar for two dogs in Auckland, New Zealand. So I'm pretty yeah. excited about Li- that. Life sucks, huh? And it's been worse. Yeah, that's, <laughs> very, that's a fire shirt you have on, by the way. Yeah, Moose Moose TV. Um, they put out some awesome... Work a lot of working dog stuff. So if you guys get a chance, check out uh, Moose Moose TV on Facebook, and you'll see a lot of working dog stuff. They featured us on some stuff there. A lot of bite dogs, all kinds of stuff on there. So it's yeah, a cool, they, they cool sent place. us a couple of shirts, and then I'm wearing one from uh, Bite Ranch Academy down in Alabama, owned by Nick Morrow. He sent us a uh, a couple of shirts as well. So thank you to those guys. Um, super super cool of them. So I wanted to, uh, a couple of news stories I wanted to discuss with you guys today, <laughs> that uh, if you guys haven't heard uh, what's been going on with these stories, I think then, everyone's heard the one. <laughs> then listen up. So uh, first one is uh, about a little, I believe it was a French bulldog. A little black I think French. So, yeah. Yeah. And so quick backstory, if I can recall, uh, family was flying. I don't know where they were flying. doesn't really matter, but they had their French Bulldog with them. And I guess the rules are if you have your dog in a uh, small enough uh, carrier that you can put on your lap or put underneath the seat in front of you, you can actually take the dog on the plane with you, even if yeah. it's not a service dog. Yeah. Um, so they do that. They have their little French Bulldog in the little carrier, and they get uh, seated and flight attendant from United, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, comes up to them and tells them, hey, we need to take your dog and put him in the uh, overhead pen. (laughs) And uh, I guess the mom started kind of arguing a little bit, saying, you're not putting my fucking dog in the overhead pen. And she said, no, I can assure you he will be fine. We've done this before, blah, 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 blah. So they put the dog in the overhead bin, um, and then flight takes off, and they land a few hours later, and they pull the dog down, and the dog is dead. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, from the overhead bin, and um, shockingly enough, there are there's not much airflow in the overhead bin, which is the uh, the initial uh, 
thought to be the cause of death of uh, course, yeah. for yeah. the French Bulldogs. There's no so, air. Well, they are investigating it now. They do have uh, the feds involved. District Attorney la- launched an investigation to United Airlines flight. And uh, I guess they're going to try to get to the bottom of that. Uh, but <sighs> they won't even let you <clears throat> put your dog in the back of the truck in the wintertime without getting 16 different complaints. Right, right. And now you're telling me it's okay to stuff your dog in the cargo <laughs> well, area here's of a what, fucking plane? Here's what gets me, guys, is, I mean, on the average flight, there's, what, 70, 80 people minimum? Yeah. You Easy. know, 70 or 80 people thought this was an okay idea. Well, no, if you look at the report, there was a lot of people that had nothing to do with the family that was on board right. that said the same thing of how they were constantly contesting that flight attendant yeah. saying, hey, I don't want to put my, there's a dog. I'm not putting a, a live animal in the overhead bin, this, right. and the other. And uh, even the other uh, f- people on the flight were reporting when the dog got in there and they closed the door, the dog was, you know, verbalizing, vocalizing, barking, all yeah, this stuff. And then stuff, it just went quiet and, after and about an hour. Quiet, and nobody checked on the dog you, when it went quiet. Do we have any idea how long that flight was? I think it was three hours. Three hours. Three hours. Yeah. Three yeah. hours. yeah. Wow. So yeah. What, what are your thoughts on this? just think, uh, obviously, they're a dumbass. I mean, that's uh, my wait, 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 thoughts on Who's it. the dumbass? Uh, you know, I always hate to blame the victim, but... I kind of feel it's a it's a mix. Yeah. yeah but you're never what, are, what are the repercussions of that though? Like it's a flight that has to take off, and you're getting. Well, if they said, "Hey, you need to put your dog in this tiny, no airflow overhead bin for three hours," or I mean, you I can't fly, flight, yeah. I would get off the flight. I get off, I get off yeah. the flight. So it goes back to people not standing up for themselves anymore. Anyways, they got to get on the flight. They got to go, but no one's going to stand there and say, "No, I'm not doing that." It's just the acceptance of, oh, this is the rule. Who this made the, the stupid rule. fucking rule? Yeah. Well, Why don't you climb I mean, up in the overhead compartment and chill for yeah, three I mean, it's, hours? It's not a rule, though. I've, I've never even heard of a dog being I've there never heard of that. No. So I'm I've never heard of I'm kind of curious what caused the uh, flight attendant to say. Well, I mean, was the dog being disruptive? Was it no, barking? she said it was blocking, like, the, the, the exit path. path. But I call total bullshit because, what, two years ago, Morgan and I went to Las Vegas and we brought Kuno, who's certified as a service dog, and... We called the airline months in advance. We got all his paperwork and a health check and all this stuff, and they still didn't reserve a seat for the dog. So Kuno, on a five-hour flight from Dulles to Las Vegas, literally held it down like at our feet. Yeah. And so it's impeding our movement if we had to get up quickly. But nobody said anything, and nobody tried to show. I just them think it's a lack of education head. on the owner and the flight attendant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It absolutely, absolutely. I is. think it's a lack of balls on the owner and a lack of knowledge. I don't really see what the the big deal is. There's no way that eight pound dog block that much traffic and then let's face it like if you're going down and you need to exit an aircraft pretty quickly there's gonna be way more shit in your way than a dog yeah of yeah. course so <clears throat> obviously this story went viral all over social media and uh there were a lot of people that shared similar opinions with all of us um i think everyone i don't think anyone actually backed the airlines on this. well to to the airlines defense they did say like yeah we take a hundred percent responsibility for this yeah. we fucked up yep. like, so they yeah, did they call it an accident they That's did say accident. so they did say that yeah they they owned up to it which you got to respect that i mean they could have you know kind of tried to backdoor it yeah 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 no they they totally took uh took fault for this however <laughs> And here it comes. Three days later, <clears throat> after they're trying to recover from that shitty uh, story, another one comes out. Uh, and this one goes viral as well. Uh, and the story with this, same airlines, is a family was traveling. Uh, they were moving from Oregon to Kansas. And they were traveling, and they ended up putting the dog in the cargo they had a german shepherd oh, yeah. you know cargo, they kind of yeah. checked him in and they can put the dogs under the plane and uh so mom goes to uh the kansas airport to go pick up her four-year-old i believe 10 year old german 10 year old jesus 10 year old german shepherd and uh the dog never showed up so they go to I guess, you know, we're in baggage claim where you yeah. lose your bags or whatever. Like, oh, no, 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 we have your dog. It's coming out right now. And it was a fucking Great Dane. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, this isn't my dog. Maybe it was a shepherd that identified as a Great Dane. <laughs> oh, there you go. But, oh, oh, I love that. That was the highlight of this, this whole show. Nice. I like that. Um, so, anyhow, so uh, the, the mistake was the Great Dane was supposed to actually end up in Japan. And... 
the Great Dane ended up in Kansas, and the Shepherd, who was supposed <laughs> to end up in Kansas, ended up in Japan. When it mm-hmm. rains, it pours, huh? So when it unfortunately, this airlines is. Uh, was it the same airline? Yeah, it was the yeah. same and airline. And statistically, too, United has the uh, the worst uh, statistic for dogs passing on their flights. So, They've had more dogs die on United. But airlines United than has, than but, any other but airline. in fairness to them, I would like to see. Well, you know, you got to play devil's advocate. Yeah, of course. You yeah, of course. A, you can't just bash a company. <laughs> well, uh, that's why we were both on this show. I can bash, and you play devil's <laughs> I advocate. I mean, to be devil's advocate, I would like to see. Does United? Do they deal with the most pets than any other airline? Because so, then yeah. rationally, well, it would make question. sense. Yeah, yeah. That that makes know. sense. Generally, that's a valid point. Yeah, I think most times. And I feel like done. United's like one of the most popular. They're one airlines. of the most popular ones to do. So it. that's one of the things you got to look at too. It's like, all right, they have the most dog deaths, but which any are unacceptable, yeah. but also are they having the most yeah. dogs processed through? I as bet well? they have because they also merged with Continental a few years ago. So that just oh, did they? Yeah, yeah. so that just completely you know radicalized the amount of flights that they have you know it's it's just one of those things you know everyone you know maybe because i own a business and i know how this shit works is you know everyone just like wants to bash all these companies but it's like you know fucking accidents happen it's human nature yeah. you know what i yeah, mean but that's two in that's three, two three days, in three days though, two major I mean? accidents yeah. in three days but, yeah, but, but, how, but how big is the company that's what i'm saying how they many have, people are they handling have millions of employees, employees. Yeah. we can also say too that the focus probably wouldn't be on that little mix-up on the shift flight if it hadn't been for the frenchie dying that's you true. think so no because just no, a mix-up yeah, mix yeah. You know, I, they, I guarantee they put the the dog back from japan and shipped it right back they to did Kansas, so they actually flew it first class and like yeah, gave, it, it, gave so it its own well here is attack. united airlines official statement an error occurred during connections in denver for two pets sent to the wrong destinations we have notified our customers that their pets have arrived safely and will arrange to return the pets as soon as possible we apologize for this mistake and are following up with the vendor kennel uh, where they were kept overnight to understand what happened, so they have not accepted fault into this one. Well, no, which, they, said a, they said it's a it's a mix up, right? Yeah, they said it's a call. Yeah. They well, they well, they said up. they're going to kind of. Oh, okay. So it must be their vendor kennel um, that works for United, to where they said they're going to you know look into it and kind of see where the mix up happened. Yeah, but I mean that's something you would pay attention to a little bit more, I would think, than just a piece of luggage, especially a ten-year-old shepherd going on a fourteen-hour flight to Japan. Yeah, the Great Dane's kind of not mistakable, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you don't really confuse. Yeah, but I mean, breeds. keep in mind they're dealing with like literally probably tens of thousands of employees, and a lot of these employees are like twenty-year-old kids that don't give a shit, and they're just like, "Hey, move this dog over there," and they're like, "Yeah, all right." You know, while they're on while they're on Facebook and shit. I mean, seriously, that's yeah. reality. Yeah. That's reality. And the everyone if- likes to think that everyone would care as much as you would. You're like, how I would never do that. It was yeah. like, think reality. It's like 20, 25 year old kids fucking off on their phone, yeah. and they're like, "Hey, take that dog. He needs to go over there." And you know, they're not fucking. And the official family statement is as follows. I'm hoping that from now on they take better care of animals. They kind of treat them like they are luggage. I'm hoping they can put something into policy so that this will never happen again. Maybe putting a picture of the animal on the outside of the pen. Um, instead of just you gotta break it down at like a toddler level. Yeah. Yeah. You're These like, look, a German here. Shepherd matches with the German <laughs> Shepherd. United's gonna have that big, huge breed diversity picture on their wall. It's gonna label every dog, <laughs> so you make sure you ship the right. I one. wouldn't be surprised, honestly, based off of these two uh, instances that United just says, "Fuck it, we're not doing pets anymore." I don't think so. You don't. I mean, I, for a while, I know maybe United for a while, or they might you know, toughen up on it. But there's way too many dogs that fly. Way too many. So, do you think they're making significant amount of money based off of animals flying? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've never yeah. flown. You got to think dog, of breeders, I haven't either. Breeders, for instance, like say you wanted a Malinois puppy and you found a oh, breeder you ship in it. Arizona, you ship it cargo. Yeah. To well, it's like two grand. That's expensive, wherever. Yeah. Right? You, no, some of them, like some of them, you ship like five hundred bucks. Depends on how far it's going. Yeah. And if there's a layover somewhere else or whatever the case, but. I've shipped dogs before, you know, across the country. You just throw them up on cargo and you ship them. Um, flights, you know, when vendors and stuff go over to Europe to purchase dogs, they put them on flights and ship them over via cargo yeah. into Chicago. Chicago's like a big hub for it. No, I, I think they definitely need to do something, though. They, they, there, something like some, needs to change. Remedial training. Going back to the Frenchie, you know. A safety standout. Shoving them yeah, up in the, in the uh, overhead bin, like, that's unacceptable. Like, something oh, yeah. needs to... 
a policy, something, in my opinion, has yeah, to don't change. Don't stuff dogs oh, in the I, fucking overhead I'm, bin. I'm sure a policy's already changed. Yeah, since that yeah. happened. Yeah, I know. I, I just, I don't know. I man. feel like they need a safety stand down and then remedial. Yeah. <laughs> Death by PowerPoint. Rem- and, then, <laughs> and then remedial training. Yeah. <laughs> And you, you know, can't really come. You can't foresee that kind of issue until it happens. No, it's you like yeah, I mean? it's like nothing's ever an issue until it happens. Uh, yeah. That's what you know. It's like I've said in the podcast before. It's like no dog is dog aggressive until it fucking until bites it the first yeah. dog. No yeah. dog's people aggressive until it bites the first person. Like no, like it's impossible to cover. And you know, you own a business. Every everyone does. Like it's impossible to cover every single possibility. Yeah. You know, it's like shampoo. When shampoo first came out, it probably said fucking throw in your hair rinse out and now it's like it don't burns. swallow don't yeah. fucking rub it in your eyes don't put <laughs> it in, in any orifices of your body because motherfuckers over the years have done all of these things yeah. got them sued screwed up and now they just got to keep adding to it so, so the whole hot coffee thing in mcdonald's yeah it's chick like, won all that money yeah it's did like did you ever see pictures of that chick no dude i mean like she was an older lady i think she was like 70 or 80 but it literally oh it was legit it was legit to yeah. sell it but you would think that if it was hot coffee like yeah but why do you have to hot serve coffee. hot coffee at the temperature of lava there's no <laughs> there's no need for that <laughs> so yeah i'm Fair sure point. i'm sure they're creating um they're creating policies i i guarantee they are as any business at this point would but i mean any loss of life in any capacity whether it's a dog human anything is unacceptable but yeah, also, shit just happens. I mean, it's human nature. Humans screw shit up, and they always will for the rest of humanity. And all you can do is adapt to that and try to do whatever you can as the company owner to ensure that it doesn't happen again by policy, safety, procedural changes. But even as we know as all business owners, any business owner does, you can even have all of those things in place, and they still fuck it up and do it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, but yeah, I also think sure. maybe the scope of the company – and the statistic of those dogs passing isn't necessarily enough to affect business enough for them to care to take more actions. And, oh, I bet you, know you they mean? lost a shit ton uh, of business. I think yeah. they, after this, is, they definitely care, I think. Yeah, oh, but yeah. how did the airline industry do after September 11th? You know oh, yeah, it hurt yeah, it for exactly. a long time. And yeah. then it comes back. Yeah, so yeah I, I mean, I of course. it's just the ebb and flow of things where, you know, statistically, how expensive is it to, like, take these million employees and retrain them and start to do, like, breed identification so they know that's a German Shepherd and all well, that Well, I don't kind of think stuff. they need to go that far. No, that's but, excessive. you know, we're joking about it, but <laughs> it, imagine how much that would cost the company vice them just continuing business as usual, and just reprimanding those individuals, road, yeah. you know but, what I mean? But and, even if it's temporary, even if it was only for a week that, say, they only lost 50% of their business, like, for an airlines, that's a shit ton of money. Yeah, like, absolutely. Like, that's... They they're possibly laying people off with losing that yeah. much money. You yeah. know you what I mean? Keep so that in scope perspective, yeah. as Well, you know, if it's just for a few days or a week or two or a month until the next like gun violence thing happens and the the national focus shifts, you know what I mean? Like that's for them, it's almost negligible. I think. Yeah, no, it it's definitely a shitty situation. Um, hopefully, it never happens again. Absolutely. I mean, it will. It will. It will yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, it just inevitably. will. Of course. I will. mean, hopefully, not the throwing a Frenchie in an overhead bin no, will happen again. Yeah, I, d- I don't think that'll happen ever again, but I mean, dogs, dogs will, will get rerouted I mean, by accident. Kids, you see kids, we've seen in the news where kids, like he's supposed to be flying to LA and he fucking ends up like in Australia. And they got a flight attendant with them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, seriously, it's happened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just human error. It's gonna, yeah. it's, all you can it's do happen. is try to mitigate it as much as possible. Um, but And I think that's what they're probably doing at this point. They're creating policies and all that, but it's still gonna happen in the future yeah no yeah. doubt it's a numbers game yep with we definitely employees and customers i mean if you have this many employees and this many customers eventually some shit's gonna get messed up yeah. in there so well we definitely want to know your guys's opinion so uh if you have them email them to info at the uh dog show and uh i'd be interested in reading them so uh mr jacob robinson Yes, sir. You come here with a pretty intense background. Yeah. A little. (laughs) A little. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about what you did in the Marine Corps. So I enlisted as an MP uh, because I went through criminal justice in a vocational school in high school. So my parents said I'm not going to sign the infantry contract. So it made sense to go MP because it's something that I already knew. I had no idea about dogs whatsoever. Um, Joined, went to MP school. And they basically offered up canine slots there, a volunteer basis. And you had to get boarded and you had to be in the whatever percentage of the class to be able to go. I was lucky enough to get a seat. Went down to uh, Lackland Air Force Base and did their 13-week basic handler course. 
and right place, right time. I was met by a couple individuals that said, hey, we haven't used tracking since Vietnam. We're looking to bring it back. We've already run one pilot course. We're getting ready to run the second. Who wants to do it? So naturally, I volunteered. Did a six-month course in uh, Yuma and 29 Palms. Uh, beautiful the, place. Beautiful. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the scenery in this. Just amazing, amazing scenery. Yeah. If you haven't went there, you should. <laughs> Take a week. Vacation. Take a week. <laughs> so we spent six months out there uh, tracking dogs. It was a good, it was a good tracking course, um, especially from not knowing anything about tracking to now being the second pilot course and running dogs and doing it. Uh, ended up certifying uh, a black lab named Jack, a little 45-pound black lab, and uh, got to my first duty station, which was Lejeune, deployed as a tracking dog handler. And right as that deployment was wrapping up, I got off the bus and was asked if I wanted to go to MARSOC. Um, which, for everyone out there, is special ops for the Marine Corps. Yeah, so it was Marine Special Operations. I was asked if I wanted to go there and be a handler for them. And uh, I jumped on the opportunity, I, you know, obviously. So we did that, and through going there and kind of getting opened up to a whole other perspective of dog training, they sent us to Von Lick Kennels to to pick up our dogs. Um, did a little course, did some dogs, and I ended up deploying twice with uh, Marsoc and my dog, and then got out. Uh, I almost went to teach a, a diabetic alert in Texas. On when I was getting ready to get out. That I don't, I don't see job. you teaching diabetic alert I don't dog. See me. <laughs> That's what everybody said when I was talking about taking that job. Um, it was a place down in Jasper, Texas. I was going to take that, that job, and then intuition kind of kicked in. I was like, that's, that's not a good idea. Um, dog-wise or like dog Dog-wise. And it was just kind of like people that worked there were emailing me saying, you might want to rethink coming here. Turns out they got in a huge animal cruelty case down there. Oh, they were goodness. using British uh, British labs, and now there's pictures of the owners in their jumpsuits and stuff. <laughs> so I <laughs> got lucky to go there, but I, I went to Von Lick Kennels and worked for a year and a half. Um, Ken Licklider. Ken Licklider, yeah. He's Papa. the man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, worked there for a year and a half, and, man, I had a time of my life up there. What would you do good. there? Um, so basically just train police and police and military dogs up there, uh, specifically in anything or in, everything, yeah. everything. So they do, I mean, they do cadaver, they do bomb, they do dope, uh, gun dogs, tracking, um, cell phone sing, dogs, yeah, single purpose, <laughs> whatever detection, dual purpose tracking, like the whole gambit. So you just get a multitude of dogs from that place that they just you know they have what you're looking for yeah how many dogs would you say you train at your time there in a year and a half i don't know too many <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot it's a constant cycle yeah, yeah. so there's all the time dogs getting shipped in from Europe right to that place and it's just like a it's a dog trainer's paradise yeah, you it's go like pick a up cyclical. dogs it's just like go get ready dogs ready for class jump in class graduate the class go right back the next Repeat. monday like you more dogs and then oh by the way we have these clients coming in because they want tracking dogs or hey we got these clients in they want single purpose bite dogs and yeah just a constant like dogs everywhere it was amazing don't just, they have like 200 or so on site there they have a bunch yeah they have, i mean they have one for everybody on site at all times pretty wow. much yeah so. i've went up to von like a few times um, and work with ken and uh, a few other people jacob uh, uh luther mcdonald um cody a lot of those guys and yeah Going up to Von Lick is definitely very eye-opening in the world of dog you training. You think, too, like with the being police and military, you, you think German Shepherds, Dutch Shepherds, Malinois. Yeah. You <laughs> have Spaniels, uh, Giant Schnauzer. That's I've awesome. seen Rottweilers in that place. I saw a Blue Mal last time I was yeah. there. Oh, man, they're gorgeous, ain't yeah. they? Yeah. I was like, I've never – This it was the first Blue Malinois I've yeah. ever seen at Von Lick. That's awesome. So, um, in Mountain, he – he is one of the trainers here at headquarters that does a lot of the trailing um, classes and board and trains for off-leash canine training. Um, maybe you can touch on, or a combination of you two, can kind of touch on the difference about what you two do or what Jacob did and what you do uh, with tracking and trailing. Yeah. Right. So tracking is a lot more like going footstep for footstep and taking that exact path that the, you know, whoever the trail layer is set. 
um, and you're not looking for any deviations off that trail where trailing you kind of recruit all the faculties of the dog from eyesight smell sound all that kind of thing um, you let the dog take air odor instead of just getting on that ground odor and so they can cut corners and um, basically make that track a little bit shorter and and kind of mitigate the time that you're spending on that track versus a dog that's going footstep for footstep when if the perpetrator that's leaving knows that that dog's going after them they're going to try to do everything they can to confuse that dog yeah. and it's not that the dog is going to get confused but it's just going to chew up time for yeah. that search team to yeah, get absolutely. to that perpetrator we're trailing you kind of cut those corners uh he doesn't play into the bullshit that you know that perp is trying to play with the dog and the dog just goes straight to where that odor is coming from yeah so as sexy as that sounds then why do we still track you need a combination of both. You can't trail on the air. You can't use trailing if you have no wind advantage. Right. Because the wind's not blowing in the dog's nose anymore. So there's going to be points on that when whoever flees, whatever flees, even like deer tracking, for instance, we get some calls on that you yeah. know, occasionally like, hey, deer recovery. And can you train a dog to do deer recovery? Deer doesn't care. You know, he's not paying attention to the wind. So he's going wherever. So if he makes a turn, he's going completely downwind. You have to have a happy combination of both. It has to be a tracking trailing combo. If it's solely tracking, you're never going to close that time distance gap. You're never going to yeah. close it. Well, not just that, but I feel like once you get into urban environments or hard surfaces, yeah, tracking yeah. gets a lot more difficult yeah. than yeah, trailing. You know, is. Tracking yeah. doesn't, you know, it doesn't, your footprint doesn't stick to the concrete. Yeah. So it's going to collect in different areas. So you need that trailing aspect of it too. They have to be able to do both. They have to. So would the Marine Corps have you do both or would you guys just do tracking just because? You we do both. Okay. I mean, I mean, we definitely did both. And it was because our main source is to – we have people running. So you have people running from IED sites. You have people running that just shot at you. You have yeah. people – and the same thing for the cops. Like cops just got shot at or had a suspect flee or do whatever. you got to be able to get on them. So, and you got to be able to close that time distance gap. So – you have to do it like we we did a combination there was no soul like just nose to the ground tracking is that just the high speed marsoc guys or is that just the way it is for the that's i think that's tracking in the working dog community as a whole gotcha. yeah is a is a tracking trailing most police departments everybody um, I think the only time that you really like legitimately see like nose to the ground tracking like is trials. Trials. Trials, and yeah. trials and competition yeah. Yeah. and you ever seen one of those dogs work I mean, they go, they it's start crazy. them. Oh, like, yeah. It's crazy. They put their nose in the footstep, and they sniff the whole thing for like three seconds, and then they move to the next footstep, and they sniff yeah. it, and then they move it's to the next. It's very slow and painful. It's very meticulous. <laughs> Method <laughs> methodical. Yeah. yeah, so even like if you did, let's say, like train like a tracking dog that went, you know, tracking. The guy would always be miles ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't you can't work that. So now you can do like a little bit faster speed tracking. We're not expecting him to hit every footstep. But still. But if you're in a competition, that's points deducted, obviously. So. Yeah, like we've done some some uh, trailing before where the track layers went, you know, like a mile and a half. Oh, yeah. And then we have a GPS on the, the handler with the dog, and the dog found him, but the dog only went like a little over a mile. So yeah. he literally cut like half a mile they off the guy's. Corners, yeah. yeah. They cut those corners to do everything. The dog's nose is phenomenal. Yeah, it's amazing. And that's the, a big saying, too, is you're never going to defeat a properly trained tracking dog. You'll never defeat it, but your job is to defeat the, the handler. handler. Go in places he don't yeah. want to go, like swamps and. <laughs> yeah, and, and tracking, tracking, I, one, I feel is just the more accepted term that everyone understands, yeah. which is why we say, you know, trailing is a, is a part of tracking. Yeah um it's also one of my favorite things to do as a trainer I, I absolutely have a ball at it um i just think it's it's so awesome to actually see the capabilities yeah. of a dog's yeah. nose like if for example for the uh, listeners and viewers out there like if i were to say nick i want you to go behind the studio here go into the woods and just go four or five miles and go hide behind a tree. I don't care where you turn or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then I send Jacob. I say, Jacob, go find Nick. I mean, Jacob's going to be looking happen. for fucking days, yeah. right? We or, proved that at Nick's ranch. Yeah, we did a video <laughs> on that. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. Or you take Mountains Board and Train, which I believe is one weekend yeah. in, yep. in the tracking program. Um, you take his board and train. You send him after take Nick. Take right to the tree. It'll take, it'll take him, you know, a half hour. Yeah. 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 for you know for for that distance so th it's it's so incredible to see even if you don't have a dog or even if you're not interested in your dog learning this 
I would definitely try to find somebody who has a dog that does this oh, and just fun. go along. Yeah, watch you know, it. Watch it. Yeah, yeah, man, it is. It is. Well, it is a blast. What's funny is we knew we had to be down here for this podcast at like two p.m. Yeah, and yeah. literally I asked these guys. I'm like, all right, if we leave now, we can hurry up and get a quick track in, and yeah. then still be there. So we like hurried up and did a track literally right before we came yeah. here with Mountain's dog. Um, the video is actually on the Off Leash Canine yeah. page. So if you go to our page after this is over and look my post before this you'll see uh and he's doing a little bit different no. he's not doing a man tracking dog he's doing a dog tracking oh dog. nice yeah. so like your dog gets lost runs out fireworks <laughs> bails you call like mountain and this dog and they come out and track your dog down for you and there's always a need for that oh yeah i was yeah. actually Absolutely. um my my uh my dog my shepherd bandit uh is is trained in it and uh we were out looking for a dog a couple of nights ago um somebody in the community lost one of their dogs and i mean he was he was on it man That's he was awesome he was on it Poetry. and yeah so um finding animals is definitely a needed thing for everywhere sure. yeah. yeah yeah i mean people lose dogs actually the day before jacob got to my house uh, i was loading up dogs i was actually going to get uh do some tracks and some guy's walking a hound down the road, and then maybe 100 yards in front of him is another hound that got off the leash and just started running. And at that point, I was about to get out the dog, but I was like, oh, he can he's just following the dog. And when yeah. he get 20 meters, dog would keep running. But, yeah, people lose dogs all the time. I see posters around the neighborhood, and yeah, it's definitely a good service for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely dig that. And, uh, that's, and that's what I like about the tracking trailings. You can apply it to so many things. Like yeah. we do man. Like yeah. the man runs and hides. Mountain has the dog. We're now the lost dog. The dog's tracking the dog. We've done, uh, me and Jacob was just talking about this earlier, um, game recovery. Yep, so the, the hunter that, you know, has the bow and he shoots that 12-point once-in-a-lifetime monster and it takes off on him and now his dream buck just bailed. Now you bring out the dog. You put the uh, dog on that deer's blood trail where it, the... Uh, arrow just went in and now the dog will go however long and track down and that deer's deer. final resting spot yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so there's just so many benefits to it and it's a lot of fun and it's, it's so also it's also so much exercise yeah. mentally and physically oh, for your dog you go on a couple of trails or even just one they're done yeah and yeah, i mean spent. they're they are spent man and there's a lot of these uh a lot of these people out here with high drive dogs and you know they've done the obedience portion yeah. you know they've they've done all that but their dogs are still you know nuts yeah. Yeah. and, and need in the house need yeah. something to do i always recommend tracking and trailing man because it's just it's it's fun for everyone involved yeah and yeah. uh it to me i feel like it's one of the biggest jobs yeah. to wear your dog out it's a grown-up hide and go seek yeah, yeah. literally yeah. that's that's what just it is. as much exercise for you as it is for your dog yeah, yeah. yeah. which which brings me to um a question we have here on facebook from uh I believe it was diane and she says uh in your opinion what seems to be the best breeds for tracking and trailing uh, i'd kind of like to go around the table <laughs> yeah on well one. i mean i already know what my and jacob's answer is probably going to be but um i mean anytime anyone asks me what's the best of anything i always say malinois <laughs> so my they say what's the best detection dog malinois what's the best tracking dog malinois what's the best protection dog malinois uh, literally i mean and i'm i'd be amazed if jacob doesn't agree once we get to him but but with that said, I, that's why I wanted to go first is to clarify is I don't want people to hear that and think like, oh, well, I don't have a Malinois, so I can't do it. Like the video we just posted is a three year old rescue. They literally just got it a month ago yeah. and it's killing it. Um, I just did a, a seminar in Pennsylvania for my trainers in Lehigh Valley last week and we had shepherds. We had Malinois. I've done it with a boxer. And the boxer was legit. I have videos of it. We've done it um, with Morgan's French Bulldog. Yeah, we've done it with a French Bulldog. Yeah. So I'm just saying if you were to ask what is the – if it's a 20-mile track and you can only pick one dog to do this, I would say a Malinois. But with that said, I consistently see a lot of French Bulldogs, just crazy boxers, like, that are really good at it. You know, a good rule of thumb to follow is if your dog can smell, they can track. So – and if they're driven by something, they have to be motivated for something, yeah. whether it's food, a ball, a tug, something – your master's um, probably not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, and, and they got to have some cardio, yeah. you know, which is why a master probably wouldn't do it because, you know, a track can go a mile and a half, two miles. So to summarize, or longer, to summarize, I would say a Malinois is the best, hands down, at pretty much everything. But I see 
and trained and have worked a wide variety of every dog you can imagine aussies labs golden retrievers i mean you remember uh, finn the golden retriever we had a a golden retriever who was a stud at it so i would say malinois is the best but i've seen a lot of amazing dogs that i think are just as good at um of some of the Malinois I've seen. So that's cool. my answer. Mountain? So I would agree with the Malinois thing. Unfortunately, my personal experience is, I think just like people, dogs have preferences, right? Especially if they're multi-purpose. So, you know, the dogs that I've, or the mouths that I've done tracking with, have been bite dogs beforehand. And so they get to the end of the track and it's not like an apprehension track where we send the dog and they're like, oh fuck, I don't get to bite nobody? Well, this is bullshit. And so I can see a difference in their drive and how they're working when it's protection versus tracking. um, Where most of the client dogs that we get, I've done labs, I've done uh, German short hair pointers, I've done German shepherds. Um, and the shepherds are always just monsters at it. Yeah. Um, and again, but none of these dogs that I do for clients really have any kind of previous specialty before we get into the track. So they're not necessarily expecting a different kind of reward at the end of it. Sure. Um, so once, you know, you have that high motivated dog and, and they want to just be in the woods like you and they learn how to dedicate themselves to that odor to get that reward. It's just, it's, it's fucking amazing. And, yeah. and you can see in the videos, like if you watch the video we just posted with um, your dog that you're training, like, they, they fucking love it. Oh, absolutely. Like, tail going nuts, nose to the ground, super excited. And yeah. like so I said, I, I think it's one of the few things that you and the dog enjoy probably about the same. Oh, absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you heard him. I was laying that trail, and he's just in the back of my truck in the kennel screaming his head off. He just wants to get out and sniff just let stuff. me track. Yeah. I mean, it's it's awesome. And then you put him up, and he knows you're out there laying that other track, and you can hear him barking from 500 just, yards like, away. let me or, at him. Yeah. yeah. Jacob? So. I'm going to say, obviously, the Malinois <laughs> is my, hands down, my favorite breed. Yeah. Um, man, I love I love a Malinois, a good Malinois. It's got to be a good one, though, not one of those. Nervy. Nervy. <laughs> so don't get it twisted. It's not that every Malinois <laughs> out there can track. Obviously, there's certain ones better than others. Um, Mal's, German Shepherds, Dutch Shepherds are all really good at it. I've seen Labs crush it. Um, and I know that there's still a lot of departments that use hounds. They use bloodhounds. Yeah, Newport yeah, yeah. is where I live. Um, low, sort of, low to the ground. Yeah. And, low to yeah. the ground. They got yep. that big old schnoz. They're, you know, that's what they're built for. They're yeah. built for for doing that. Yeah. And they're phenomenal at it. I just think they're a little bit, for me personally, they're a little bit too slow. Okay. They tend to they tend to track really well, but they're just a little bit slower yeah. than like a high drive, Malinois. Just, I mean, I've you can't keep up with them. That's why you have to have that oh, thirty yeah. foot leash because. Yeah. Yeah. Dude will be Even then you're putting on the brakes. Even then you're putting on the brakes, like, working them. Whereas, like, a, a bloodhound, yeah, they move pretty quick, too, but it's just not the same. Yeah. Yeah. What did you guys use when you went to VLK, or uh, Georgia? Uh, they had hounds. They had uh, um, bloodhounds out there, a um, few other. Yeah, and then at VLK, I had... Or Dutch that, Shepherds, that was German Shepherds, Malinois. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A mix, yeah. Uh, Another department down by me, they use bloodhounds. I see them working right next to uh, Josh. He's got a bunch of woods right around his location, and they're always out there training their bloodhounds. I, I, I feel like for the police departments, uh, that's one of the more popular breeds for, for the track. Well, it's easier dogs. to handle. It that's used, what I think. It, I, would, I would agree with that. It used to be that, but a lot of them are shifting. Do you think, though, that it was based off of the the so, stereotype that yeah. the hounds were built for that? Or yeah. do you think that possibly... Uh, those hounds are also able to be good advocates for that canine unit because they're able yeah. to go out into the community, unlike, you know, batshit crazy mouths yeah. who are, you know, barking Spending nonstop. Yeah, and, you know what I mean? I, I think it wasn't really until the 90s, you know, that pets being inside was even popular. When you used to have a dog, I remember as a kid when we used to have dogs, they were they're outside. outside yeah. Yeah. yeah, And they had a job. Like, most of the time, like, they would do something for us, right? Yeah. Um, so people like huskies and stuff like that use them as sled dogs. So back then, like when the whole working dog and everything, because we've been using dogs forever, forever yeah. to do stuff, they really took a look at what the dog was bred for and utilized what it was bred for. We didn't even have Malinois in this country until the 80s, yeah. Right, you know? Yeah. And then we start bringing them in, you know, through the military, and that's where they're starting to get popular because people are making the, you know, Max. The big movie, you know, <laughs> Max and all that stuff. Yeah. And working dogs have become pretty common because, I mean, Use the hell out of them overseas. Um, and a lot of police departments have started, you know, going that route because they can see the benefit of how fast it moves. But back to my point, like way back when, when a dog had a job, you know, like you had herding dogs that herded, you had yeah. bloodhounds that were known for tracking and finding stuff. And then you had, 
German shepherds that were known for their bite work and their nose on odor and you had like other stuff. So now recently as you know, the working dog community envelops and grows, you see like, well, let's see what else we can do with this dog. Yeah, let's see if we can it. use something else. So I think the bloodhound unfortunately will probably eventually be phased out of department. Really? Work. Wow. But I look at it as like, if you're just looking for just a tracking dog, whether you're like a police or a, a prison or something like just yeah. to track, um, I feel like for a lot of cases, a bloodhound, people would prefer that because it's more handler yeah, friendly. Yeah, it's definitely more handler friendly. It's like I can give you this chilled bloodhound for the next 10 years yeah. and we need him, or I can give you this insane fucking Malinois, but hey, at least one hour every three weeks, he'll do a killer track. You know yeah, here's I mean? the super benefit of having... So I feel like it's having, just more friendly for a handler. There's definitely like huge benefits to having that hound on, especially for like you know Alzheimer's patients, for instance, if they you know, get lost, they wandered off. Now you can take a bloodhound and go track it. Whereas if you took your, you know, police, typical police Malinois, like he's probably looking for a bite at the end of it. And you don't want to just happen across the Alzheimer's patients in the woods and get bit. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. See, my answer to that question, as far as favorite breed for tracking and trailing, I, I can't say, I can't agree with you guys on this. Sorry. <laughs> I can't just sit there and say it's a, Britney a Spaniel. Malinois. We all love a Malinois. It's one of right. my favorite breeds as well. And we all know that, you know, they're definitely more than capable of tracking. Um, the problem I have by saying that is I think 98% of it has to do with who the handler is. Because there is a complete 100% difference um, following a Malinois on a 30 foot lead through, through the woods and following a, uh, bloodhound, bloodhound or a lab <laughs> yeah. through the woods behind a 30 foot lead. Uh, you know, if you're not physically, uh, able to get behind that Mal, which is going to be uh, fifth gear the entire time. Yeah. And he's going to be, you know, going left, going right, going left, going right. Because his mind is in such overdrive at this point. You know, he's he has such, you know, uh, just happiness going on that, you know, he's, he's just going balls to the wall. If you don't have that kind of physical stamina to get behind that dog, then that's not going to be the best dog. Because yeah. you're actually going to do more damage than, yeah, than yeah, good man. with that. Yeah. Because you're going to end up fucking the dog up. He's going to you know come back because he's got to wait for you because you're pulling yeah. him back he maybe thinks it's a you're correction him, yeah. you know what i yep. mean so i think a lot of it just happens to depend to depend on who the handler is i think yeah. that's true along any dog aspect in, in any it's work, yeah, yeah any job yeah, but any, i my, my point is is i just don't think it's that simple but to, you're but you can't you're kind of skirting the question though you can't say which is the best dog for and then your answer is the hand it depends on the hand well i i do i mean okay so for me so all handlers for are me equal. personally so, no, no, so no. if you're handling okay, okay. you're handling 10 dogs i, I one's probably, a frenchy one's a malinois one's a dutch shepherd I probably still would say down, Malinois. And you got to no, track down no. ten. You, gotta, you wouldn't rather handle Malinois for tracking. Probably he would not. rather handle. You know, and Joe had rather handle a standard poodle. <laughs> hey man, if he's gonna go <laughs> at my pace, there fuck you it. Go. There no, you but go. seriously, I, I little like pink I've, ribbons in its ears. I've trained. I've trained quite a few mouths in tracking, and one thing I can say about them: all the when they're on, they're fucking on. Yep. But that overdrive can play to to the negative of, of I, actually, actually tracking when I was, as when well. I was in Pennsylvania just teaching them tracking, I kind of said the same thing. I said the, the thing about Malinois that I've learned in tracking trailing is they're generally a little bit harder to get started. Because, yeah. you know, the person goes and does the track, and they're like, we're just going nuts, and they're working themselves up. And now when you say search, they're so worked up, they're not, like, like sniffing and applying themselves fully, where the chilled out, like, German Shepherd just sat in there, and you're like, search, and he's like... And just bump, and he goes right into it. So yeah. what I – that actual analogy I told them, I said, I find that they're a little sometimes harder to start because that craziness. But then once they get it, they really fucking got it at it's that like most things, too. you got to think of even teaching them to do odor. They're just freaks. Yeah. yeah. They're just freaks well, about see, everything. They have – they're not bred for patience. And that's, no. that, <laughs> that's kind of my point, though. Like when I get behind a dog in the woods, I want that dog to be – pretty much methodical joe wants I want, to just enjoy the walk in the woods i want, I want <laughs> not, seriously though i want him to think i want him to use his mind and kind of process this uh this information he's taking in right. whereas a lot of times and you guys know this with mouths it's like oh smell see it you know yeah, and they're yeah. fucking gone 
And yeah. it's like sometimes that can happen to where they overshoot yeah. the the yeah, scent yeah. pull or whatever, yeah. and that could actually you know do more damage than good on a trail. That's why I like the. I like the just regular German shepherds, to be honest yeah. with you, when it comes yeah. to tracking. Leo was a beast. Yeah, he was, Remember him? dude, he was one of my favorites, was like, for sure. That, that video we did was like his third track ever. Yeah. You know? And if you remember how methodical he yeah, was. super. I mean, that's what I really like. So it was, six, it was 16 acres, and I'd been through a couple of combat tracking courses through the Marine Corps. You gave me, what, a 30-minute? Uh, I think 15 minutes. It was okay, a good so video. So it was like 15 we'll post minutes. The link in here. And I had uh, a quad, so I was on a quad. Yeah. Uh, knew where he started from and that was it and i tracked him within what maybe 20 meters and yeah. i lost spore and so i did a couple of box recon and i couldn't find anything and so we called it i, I timed out yeah. and then leo literally from the moment he started i think it was like three minutes yeah, or, or eight, less or less or something like that for him to find him in that 16 acres and it was never like oh it's crazy right i don't think i should go this it was just no and like, that was literally uh leo's third or fourth like yeah. a track ever. Hey, like, he's, he's, he's never even done it before. It. And that yeah. was in the and he was a shepherd too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, but but that's why I like the German shepherds because I feel like they they slow it down just enough to be methodical. Yeah. Um whereas mouths can kick into overdrive and let that drive actually affect their decision making. Yeah. Um and I don't know, it's just kind of my personal opinion. I know mouths are really good at it. You know, I've trained several of them for it, but I know if you ask Ken Licklider, he would say mouths. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And Jeff Shedler would probably say hounds, to be honest with you. I imagine uh, he would. That, he loves them. Well, that's how I was going to say. That's his, he like, them. He go always to. gets them in. He's, yeah. like, he's excited, you know, every time a shipment of hounds comes in. Yeah. He's that's super stoked thing, about too, it. But that's his thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, and and that, just like Mal's is Ken's thing. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of the cool thing about what we do is we don't all have to have the same answers, yeah. and we don't all have to be wrong, yeah. you know? So that's, you know, that's kind of the point of where I'm going next with, it's kind of like saying, I think a lot of it's like saying, uh, <laughs> like you said, like we can all have different answers and still not be wrong. It's kind of yeah. like if I went around the table and said, what do you prefer, Coke or Pepsi? Yeah. Like we could have some different answers, but there's none of them are right. It's you opinionated. Know I mean? yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's opinionated. And experience-based. Like Jeff has a lot of experience with hounds, so yeah. that's his go-to. So he can read them yeah. a lot better. Ken, yeah. Jacob, they have tons of experience with Mal, so that's their go-to. Yeah, so. yeah, so... Um, which kind of brings me to my next point about, you know, regular day uh, pet owners who uh, who are still looking for that job for their dogs. That This is one of the one of the few uh, jobs that I highly, highly recommend to most pet owners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, assuming that they're capable, you know, they're and, active people that yeah, want to be outdoor active. People. Exactly. Um, you know, and obviously we get the question, can my dog do this? And I always say, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I truly believe any fucking dog can do it. Um, well, at least to what capacity. Yeah, it's to what capacity. At Lehigh Valley, to put in perspective that seminar I just did, we had nine trainers and eight dogs showing up. Um, and people's like, well, I don't know if my dog do it. I'm like, we'll just bring him. Like, everyone who wants to fucking bring yeah. a dog, just bring a dog, and yeah. we'll let you know whether your dog can do it. Eight out of eight all could do it and do it well. So, I don't think an English bulldog could do it. <laughs> I don't think I, an English bulldog could. I think they could, just not a long track. And maybe here to the yeah, door. Yeah, I mean, they could do it. I, I guarantee I could train <laughs> one to do it for a good 20 yards or so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because if you think about beast it, too. like the way I look at it is if you put that English bulldog out in the streets, like no food, it would find food. So that means it's yeah. it's tracking. So well, dogs are survivalists. Yeah, they only care about four things. Yeah, yeah. Tell, it, please tell everyone. Yeah, let, what let's those. hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> they only care about four things: food, water, sex, and air. That's it. Food kind of like people. If food. you really break it down, food, water, sex, and air. If, if you really break it down, yeah. If, mean, it, if it doesn't include their survivability, they could give a damn. Yeah. You think Fluffy loves you? Go ahead and don't feed Fluffy and let somebody else. I guarantee he goes to the we, other person. We, we've, we've had our this. we've had our discussions about yeah. dog loyalty yeah. before. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're gonna do a whole podcast That's for on, another episode. On loyalty yeah. and dogs, yeah. <laughs> and how it doesn't exist. Yeah, <laughs> me, little Co teaser for you guys. Yeah, me, Cody, uh, Cody Talent, Desiree, and Joe like a week ago had for some reason this deep conversation at my house, <laughs> and it was about <laughs> dogs and loyalty, and we yeah. decided we're gonna do a podcast on. There it, you go. So. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is water? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's time for me to go. You guys going to finish this or what? <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I, I really do believe that any dog is capable of doing tracking. So it's definitely something to look into if you're still looking for a job for your dog. I, I told the people in Lehigh, I like I think an English bulldog could do it. Like, but to what point? Like yeah, any any person 
can play basketball. Any yeah. person can play golf. Any person can play football. But it's like, how good are you going to be compared to this guy? Right. Yeah. So that's how I look at Mal's like, or uh, trackings. Like, yeah, an English Bulldog, I feel 100% confident would do it. But would it do it enough where it was worth it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And then how long do you think it would take you to actually train it? Yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, does the does it doing it outweigh? You know what I mean. Yeah. Like, and then the big thing is is to figure out what do you want your dog to track. You know, yeah. do you want it to track a person? Yeah. Do you want it to track uh, deer, deer, uh, dogs, which is a huge need everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, people lose their dogs nonstop. Yeah, um, it's a big it, issue, and it, and it and it happens. You know, um, so y you could be that person that they call up and say, hey, you know. Uh, I lost my dog. Can you help? And they're right there with their, you know, yeah, eight if, month old lab ready to go. Yeah. And and if you know, you know, like your dog's a flight risk and stuff like that, like it'll, some of our trainers use those whistle. We're things. actually, they actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, whistle is actually a brand new sponsor of the show this week. Uh, if you haven't looked them up, check them out. I highly, highly recommend. We use them. Yeah. Uh, for say, our I personal do dogs. Them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's just because in my, in my outlook, you can trust a dog, even as well trained as it is, you can trust a dog 99% of the time, but at the end of the day, it's a dog yeah. and just you like people you and you still have, people. and yeah. you still have that 1%. So yeah. I like, I like knowing that this little, I mean, the whistle, it's like the size of a quarter. It really is. It yeah. just attaches to the flat collar and they have an app that you can go on your phone and you can literally track in live time of where Pun your intended. dog's at, there you go. Uh, <laughs> of where your dog's at, um, no matter if it's in the woods or if it's kind of cruising around downtown by itself. You can go on your phone, you can see the cross Like streets. a live map, right? Yes, it's insane. I, to be honest, I'm not that familiar with them. I know you use them, but it, what, like, how much are those? Oh, man, I, I don't want to give the wrong number because they sponsor the show. <laughs> uh, but what I can tell you is that if you uh, if you go to their website, uh, whistle.com, I believe is what it is. I'll, I'll double check that right now. Um, and when you if you decide you want to purchase one, you could actually get fifteen dollars off by uh, uh, when you go to check out using the discount code dog show. Oh, uh, nice. To get fifteen dollars off, Nick didn't even know about this no. um, prior because <laughs> uh, they were tracking. He was late for the show, so uh, go figure. Yeah, it is definitely whistle dot com um, that you can go check that out. Uh, it is seventy nine ninety five, uh, which isn't bad. No, That's it's it's bad. a lot cheaper than a lost dog. Yeah, Plus, definitely. Because like you know, if you got to call like the owner of Mountain's dog and say, "Hey, I need you to drive your dog down here and help," it's going to be more than eighty bucks once. Yeah. 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 So yeah. sixty five bucks if you use the uh, discount code. That's dog not bad show. at all. That's really not bad. I know. Do you like? I know, and like not just because they're a sponsor, but like legitimately. Do you? Are you a fan? I've been using them for two years. Yeah. Sean. Sean. Sean uses yeah. them. Yeah, like right. like sure. when when they reached out to us saying they wanted to sponsor the show, I'm like, are you? Because we're we've discussed when we even started the show on episode one, we said no matter what sponsors we take, we're in, gonna keep it real, and it's gonna be sponsors <laughs> that we personally advocate yeah. for. I know you yeah. used them, but and um, you like uh, there's a monthly fee, right? Yeah. There is a there is a subscription. Uh, I, it's not much. It's I, like five bucks a month. Six or Mine's seven a month. nine ninety nine, and I have like ten of them. Oh wow, um, oh, wow. that's not bad. Yeah, no. So uh, for uh, board and train. It's yeah, also there you an go. Activity tracker, so it's kind of like a Fitbit for the dog as well. So if you're not home all day and your dog's like, oh, it's like telling you how much yeah, work it's putting in. Dog, obviously, if you know if you have a mal and the activity tracker saying the dog's not moving, then obviously something's wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so vice versa, if the dog's through the roof. You know, you'll know that as well. So if you couldn't hear Sean, uh, which is running the boards again today, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, he said that the whistle callers also have a, uh, an activity tracker to where you can kind of track how many uh, steps it's taking. And, you know, all. so, I mean, it's, I, dude, I, I'm a huge fan of yeah, it. Yeah, I know you used them. It's so waterproof. If, the dog can go fucking swimming geez. with it. Like, yeah. So if you guys That's don't cool. use a whistle, then you can call someone like Mountain's client <laughs> yeah. and yeah. Uh, I'm gonna they can track down I'm going to this to my dog. brother. My brother loses his corgi on a weekly basis. <laughs> and they connect to the AT&T uh, cell phone towers, which really? AT&T has like the best service in, in this country. So Next to Verizon. Um, I, don't I, don't so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have either of those. I don't have either of those, but they do use the uh, cell phone towers. So, you know, if you have phone service in your area, that GPS collar is going to work perfectly fine. So... You know, again, check them out. Uh, I didn't want to spend too, too much time on this, but whistle.com. 
uh, discount code dog show if uh, you want to get 15 bucks off. So that's the way you can track your dog if you don't have a dog. Yeah. Can track now, say dog. say the battery dies, say you never got one, you didn't take our advice, and you lose your dog. Well, then there are companies out there, uh, for-profit and non-profit, that will go out there and bring out their tracking dog. And that's what yeah. Mountain's doing. Yeah. He's training here's, a dog for a client that's using it for a tracking dog that. services. It's like, let's say you lose your dog, Joe. Yep. You didn't have the whistle. You lose your dog. How, wait, how long are you waiting to call somebody to... To come track your dog? Uh, maybe a couple hours. So That's what I would guess. I don't feel like I'm going to wait like three days. See, I think the average person, uh, you're, like you're thinking from a hours. trainer. I think it's a yeah. lot longer. Yeah. I really do. I think yeah. it's a lot longer because I think the average person, their emotions take over so much that they're in the woods themselves looking. And, you know, they're kind of posting on every lost and found group page on yeah, Facebook. Yeah, checking the shelter sites and yeah. stuff like that. And, and then I think yeah. once they're – I think I, – I always feel like the tracking dog is the last resort for most yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. In which case you have to have a really good tracking dog if it's yeah. been two days since you've seen Oh, uh, yeah. That'd well, so we know though. that the only thing that kills odor is UV, UV rays, right? Yeah. So UV rays is the only thing that does it. So now you're looking at minus two hours from a trainer's perspective is what I would want to get on the track at. Yeah. Like, yeah probably bare minimum two hours like i'm there i'm ready to go because i know what my dog's stamina is and other than that like you know he may not be able like if i start at the start point you know two days later basically you got to go off of say hey, so and so saw him go down here way. at this road so let's go down here try to get on it and now we're trying to find like you know old joe blows out there like ah, oh, he's over there you know and now you got to find the scent pad you pick it up and then try to track it and then that's tough you know dogs can run super fast so yeah. And then you, you have to deal with contamination of the, yeah. the yeah, longer it sets. You know, you could have a fucking pack of coyotes walk yep. over that trail deer that could deer. throw it completely yeah. off. You and your 10 friends walking in the woods searching for it. And, and, and quick story, that's kind of what happened with Bandit the other night. You know, we're in the woods and we we had uh, the blanket of where the dog was at, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just put the blanket down of kind of where he took off. So I took Bandit up to it, smell the blanket and sent him on his way and man he was on he was on and then we got maybe i don't know maybe three four hundred yards through the woods and bandit throws up a proximity alert which is uh pretty much a clear signal from the dog to the handler saying hey we're close get ready you know um so i got excited i was like shit here we yeah. go and uh he actually for the first time ever started barking on a trail as he was going hmm. for, not for long for maybe 50 feet or so so i was like what the fuck you know this yeah, is crazy yeah. and then he stops and he just looks up and then you know i kind of look up and maybe about 70 yards up was a guy walking his german shepherd oh, oh, so nice. bandit was completely on and he got caught off by a random guy walking his dog yeah. over yeah. our trail yeah, yeah. And it, it, it took a lot for me to try to get him back on at that point because he was kind of, in his Side mind, tracks. well, in his mind, he thought he won. Yeah. You know? yeah, he thought he found it already. He thought he found it. So he was like, what, what else do you want me to do? What do you mean, search? Yeah. Right. <laughs> search for what? You know? <laughs> it's so, here. Yeah. So, um, so that definitely, you know, plays in part for sure. I definitely feel like there's a major need for uh, dog tracking dogs. Quality dogs. Quality yeah. dog yeah. tracking dogs, awesome. absolutely. Because you can go on any community Facebook lost and oh, found yeah. page, you're going to find a dog damn near every day. Yeah. Yeah. So the moral of the story, guys, everyone watching, is if your dog bails on you, uh, try to call much sooner than later. Yes. Yeah, definitely. You greatly increase your chance of success. success. It's like the show, like, the first 48. Yeah. Like, you know, if they... Oh, get, that's a good... Oh, yeah. No, that's a good yeah, point. It's like, if we get out of this 48-hour window, our chance of finding the perpetrator like drops like 80%. Yeah, so I'd yeah. say it's the same for a tracking dog. Like once you get out of that, you know, 6 hour window, the the chances of finding is now we dropping. Have, me personally, I have tracked 3 days later in the middle of the Yuma desert um and found it. So that was part of the tracking course. We wanted to see how long we could go. About how long? It was you 3 days. Leave it a cold trail. It's 3 days later. What's the longest trail you've been on? Track Three days, real life, <laughs> real life, or like like distance wise, yeah, whatever. Oh, distance training, wise. Training wise was uh, a little over five miles. Five um, miles, that's still a deep. long track. Yeah. yeah, that's really deep. 
a little over five miles, and then I think like real life, no more than probably fifteen hundred meters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they usually like hunker down below a fucking trailer or yeah. <laughs> like yeah. something like that. What about yours, Mountain? What, you, any idea what your longest one is? So I've done a mile with one of our clients. He did a mile long the track set for an hour and a half, and there's twenty three mile an hour gusts. Wow, dude! The wind when we did that track today with your dog, that wind was fierce. Yeah, then too. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be tough. This wind's fierce." And as you'll see in the video, he just fucking yeah, he just went. On it. Yeah, that, yeah that's one it of was my, fierce to us. That's one of yeah. the things that I try to focus on more so than anything else is like the quality of of that track or that trailing. So not necessarily caring of oh, this dog can do a thousand meters or two thousand meters, but it's like okay, how much other shit can you throw in that thousand meters that can distract like the dog yeah. that the dog will still stick on trail? Yeah, because so, yeah. we jumped really, over that uh, that uh, rabbit fur, whatever it yeah, was. Yeah, so we're using fur, right? Fur and pet dander, and I go to a bunch of different like grooming salons, and I you know bag a bunch of fur, and mm-hmm. then basically that's what I'm dragging through the woods to create the trail of the lost dog. And we have used live dogs as well. But uh, so he's, you know, seeing these tufts of fur every once in a while or, you know, catching odor of fur you can't even see with your eye. Um, and we went right over a trail where probably a coyote got a hold of a bunny. And so there's tufts of fur all over the place. And he goes right up to it, and he was just like, nope, that's not a dog. And then just kept yeah, right on the trail. It and then so, yep. it's, you know, it's not necessarily always how far can your dog go, but the quality that, you know, how, how committed to that one specific odor is your dog going to be. So in summary, you would say it's not about the stamina, but it's about – the quality that you use in the short time that yeah, you have. Yeah, it's about the motion of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> that that's just life, brother. <laughs> that's just life. Um, yeah, I, I I definitely agree with that. I think our longest track is probably one of the ones we did down in Georgia. I mean, with that last one we it's did. Like, what was that? I forget how long that was. Fuck, it was man. took forever though. It felt like fifty miles. Yeah. I can <laughs> tell you that. It felt yeah. Like forever. Yeah. Like in the swamps. Are you talking of about Georgia. with Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I, I've seen his videos yeah, we're, online. We're that down there. Through. We're yeah. down there in the swamps or graduation track. And <laughs> quick story on this one. And so there was three of us: me, Nick, and and Daniel Carter, off Leash, Ohio. Uh, we went down there together and we're on our last track called it our graduation track and uh, we were gonna, it was a tactical track so yep. we had one handler two flankers yeah there paintball you go. guns yeah, we and got everything paintball guns. I mean we're camoed up yeah. ready to fucking go we were excited as shit until we got about fucking 10 miles into this <laughs> into this <laughs> the track swamp, in the swamps 130 degrees. I'm the handler these guys I look back because we have on the other side is our enemies right yeah and i look back because dog throws up a proximity alert see where my flankers are expecting you know guns to be drawn no, and everything. File. no they're on their phones <laughs> chit-chatting with each other about 50 yards behind me no i, wasn't I was like bad. joe's doing a good job <laughs> uh that sucked but uh it was it, it was, was a long it was a long yeah. long track. and what was funny like halfway through that track like a couple miles in there was this gas can. oh right? yeah there was this gas can and the dog like tracks up like just all over this fucking gas can like sniffing all around it like spends like probably like a solid minute which is a long time right, yeah, you know, right. to stay dedicated and he's like just all right fuck it and he just moves on and we're like are we close so we didn't know at the time but we were like halfway in so we get up to them throws up proximity alert dog finds him through all this so we're like jeff we're like dude like we thought you were way the fuck <laughs> back here because uh your dog, I forget his name, Ranger, I think that was his name. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It We're was like, Ranger. dude, like, Ranger, like, there was this fucking gas can back there that he just got really fucking hung up on. Like, so we thought, like, you were close then. And he started dying laughing. He's like, that was it like a red gas can with this thing? And we're like, yeah. He's like, dude, like, I, as I was running, like, I stopped and I pissed on that yeah, thing. Yeah, so, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I pissed on that and just, like, kept running. And yeah. it was so funny to see the dog was like, all right, there's a ton of human odor right yeah. here. Yeah. You know? That dog was a beast, man. Yeah, and that was, was a hound. That yeah, was he was a hound, hound and he was yeah. legit. Yeah. Raider. 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 Raider, that's what it Raider was. was Raider. Yeah, he was super legit. That yeah, dude's pulling he, snakes out of the swamp and stuff all the time, too, on his Facebook page. Like, hey, oh. look at this snake I found. <laughs> yeah, some really good dogs down there at Georgia K9 now. <laughs> yeah, for he sure. He puts them through it down there. He yeah. puts them through it. Yeah, he definitely does. There's no doubt. He puts the fucking handlers through it, too, I yeah. can tell you yeah. that. I have never been more tired in my or wet in my entire <laughs> yeah. life, man. Yeah. I mean, all week long, just soaked. That's probably yeah. one of my favorite questions, too, is, like, how does water 
can you just cross a river? It affects and the handler. It definitely yeah. affects <laughs> the handler. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it definitely affects the trail as well. It does. Like I, I, especially if it's moving. Yeah, yeah, and I like the idea of, and I can't remember if Jeff does this or not. And you guys, let me know if you do this. But I like the idea of when I'm teaching it to kind of walk the if it's a river kind of walk the um the bank the shoreline yeah and look for that that exit cone yeah, right that yeah. scent cone exit yeah. and then cross and then when you get to the other side walk that shoreline again yeah. if the dog didn't find it and try to find you know what i yeah. mean the the other well, side that's what, of it. when they ask me of that about lehigh valley because we you see in that video we have that big river creek thing there and yeah. they're asking like well how does this affect the dog and i'm like well the good thing about a river a stream is they always had to enter somewhere and they always have to exit somewhere yeah yep. so i was like maybe they enter and swim a mile down but eventually they had to fucking get out somewhere yeah. and that's all you got to do is take the dog and try to find that exit yeah, just find that cross point. yeah yeah, yeah. or yeah. let the wind take them across if it's blowing in the right direction yeah. you know i mean yeah. maybe they'll get a good headwind you know as soon as you get to that river or that creek and and dog doesn't even skip a beat i mean yeah. that's 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 happened several times so uh diane wants to know on facebook nick where uh where she can go if the average person just wants to do tracking and trailing for their dog um uh, yeah i mean some of our locations offer it like our lehigh valley location offers it our harrisburg pennsylvania i mean we have a good amount of locations that offer uh tracking trail pretty much so, all of virginia yeah everyone in virginia all of our locations of virginia offer it a lot of our locations in pennsylvania offer and some other ones um so i would say the best thing you can do is just email info at offleashcaninetraining.com and just ask like hey do you have anyone in my city my state that does this and if we don't um we can probably refer you to yeah, someone for that sure. does you know as you guys see on the podcast all the time like i don't just promote off leash off leash like we how we've had a lot most of our guests on here have not have been off not leash, been off leash canine yeah. trainers actually yeah. um so yeah i can definitely point you probably in the right direction to someone that does offer but it's a lot of fun like it, it is a lot of like fun. literally i'm like you think we have time to do one before the yeah. podcast <laughs> that's awesome man. and we're gonna do one after too so yeah it's a lot of fun and it's great exercise too yeah a lot of fun um what about uh jacob so you don't do that many tracking dogs now you do a lot of protection stuff right bite dogs yeah favorite yeah. bite favorite bite dog <laughs> standard poodle standard poodle yeah malinois yeah yeah malinois yeah. still but you told me uh like some of the hardest hitters cody talent said i think one of the hardest dogs he got was a german shepherd and you said uh rottweiler right? rottweiler uh, Rottweiler hit that sleeve and you could hear it pop through. The and they puncture. asked me, like, yeah, it just popped through whatever that material is that's in there. So he goes to the jute and just, he crunched so hard he just popped it. And they're like, all right, you ready to put on the suit? And I was like, this is the one and only time I've ever been like, where's the gauntlets at? <laughs> So it kind of kinda punked you then, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that dude was for serious. Did he have cardio, though? No. Or was he like a one no. hit, a one hitter quitter? You know, that dog, he was actually, I want to say he was a PH1 title dog out of Europe. And, uh, I mean, he was a definitely in shape, fit Rottweiler, nice. um, tracking genius. Oh, good really? At tracking. So just a great rot. I don't yeah. feel like you see that a lot in rots. No, I don't think you do really either. But Not yeah. in this country. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was, he was my once in a lifetime rot. Like I, if I ever wanted to rot, that's you would I pick wanted. him. Yeah. <laughs> and he was phenomenal. Um, he's a good dog, but his stamina, you're right. The stamina just wasn't, yeah, I wouldn't wasn't think there. They would have the, the stamina um, for it. So what out of out of all the dogs you're working in protection, what percentage would you say are mouths? Probably eighty percent of them. Eighty. Yeah. Probably eighty percent of them, and that's the thing too is like, I think my location, as a whole, get I get more phone calls on protection training, than I do on like any other like additional, you know what I mean? Like, Add on. So besides training. just obedience, like what else can you do? A lot of people are asking for for protection. And we always do that eval, like, hey, can we eval the dog capable? and make sure? Yeah. And I tell people, I'm like, hey, your dog will definitely do this for fun, but nothing's ever going to turn of it. Glorified game of um, tug. Yeah. yeah, it's a glorified game of tug with you and your dog. Like, he doesn't, if someone drop kicks your front door, that dog's probably peeing itself and trying to run out no. the back. But he has fun doing it. So do you want to do it for fun, or are you looking for, like, a legit protection dog? Yeah. And, and then. A lot of people I don't think realize that. I yeah. Mean, I'm sure you've heard this probably more than me, where they're like, "Oh, I don't need that because I know if it came down to it, my yeah, dog would protect it, yeah. me." My favorite sales call. And, yeah. and what would you say as 
generally an expert in training protection dogs. I mean, better than, I mean, it's going to be hard to find anyone with more. What would you say to me who says, I have a Malinois, I have a Shepherd, I have a Dutchie, I have Rop, insert any breed here, and I don't need to do that because I know if it came down to it, my Shepherd or Mal would protect me. What statistical percentage would you put on that probability? I mean, that's... That's like a, not even a 1%. No, so you'd probably. say less than 1% less of than 1%. untrained protection yeah. dogs would Now, protect. let's say that you you got, you know, a whatever. He's untrained, but you got him from whoever, and you raised him, and you're in the back country, and no one's ever seen that dog except for you and your family. So he's just an under-socialized yeah, he's dog. Under-socialized, yeah. And you might get a fear bite out of that, but he's not doing it for protection. He's doing it because he's scared, and he's never really met anybody else, and you're his circle. Yeah. And why is this stranger here? But that's not even the right reason. So to be an aggressive. overall, just an average happy-go-lucky dog is going to turn it on when it comes no, time. Never, never, not never. <laughs> Here's never. this is what I always tell people, and I think it goes along with like your favorite way of explaining things: is where in nature do you ever see anything else eat up the food chain? Yeah, they don't. Yeah. And so where one of the most hunts, unnatural clearly. things we do with dogs is, is teach them bite work. Yeah, yeah. to bite it's, a human. They don't go up the food chain. You're absolutely right. Yep. Generally yeah. speaking, it doesn't happen. Not saying that it's never happened, but it just generally doesn't happen. So pretty much, you would say if you have a dog and it's not trained in protection, the chance of it protecting you when it comes so time know. is I less than one percent. I met one dog that we did. We, we we did some obedience with it last year, and it was a it's a South African Mastiff. Oh, horrible, horrible, yeah, horrible. And uh, we played the game with that dude a little bit, and then it turned into like he didn't want to play the game at all. He didn't want to expend his energy playing this game which he didn't deem was necessarily fun but push comes to shove if someone in drop kicks that dude's door god help you because he's going to rip your throat so out. so in like 10 plus years and thousands upon thousands of dogs you've seen one that you one. think would probably turn it on maybe two and what's funny is i always ask like our protection experts like i've asked cody talent on here the same question i asked luther the same question i asked bob salamini uh when he was on with me the same question and literally everyone pretty much does the same answer. Like, oh, it's less than not. 1%. And I like asking that question a lot because we get different viewers. And that's a huge misconception. And that's why I ask that so everyone out there doesn't rely on that false well, sense of security when it comes down to Generally it. Generally speaking, when you get a hold of me and you say you want to do protection training, we're going to do the evaluation and I'm going to tell you no. 99.99% of the time just not your dog just doesn't have the aptitude and then the problem resides in people go get these breeds that are capable of doing it and but they don't do right. anything for yeah. a year and then they call me and the dog's a year old and they're like hey can you do this and I'm like bring it over check it out and, and now he, he's like a nervy fearful Mal and now like <laughs> he might play but let's say like maybe he plays ball like he's really good at fetch so he plays ball and then you try to change the toy to something you try to basically say, like, hey, this is fun, too, but maybe throw a tug, and then you try to get them to play tug, but most people teach their dog an out command mm -hmm. really young. So as soon as you grab that tug, he's dropping it. So there's no possession there, and one of the big things with bite work in general is possession. So everybody who trains bite dogs or raises puppies in the sport world or does this, they start at, like, the infancy stages, like, six weeks, yeah. and they're playing with this. And then you hear other people out there saying, well, don't do anything with them you know, until they're six, eight months old. Well, that's just not the right answer because you have to build that foundation. You miss the target window. Yeah, you miss that target window. And I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying... You made it harder. You definitely made it harder to to work with because these guys that are doing this for a living are doing it like six, eight, ten yeah, weeks old. Something. And, you know, the puppies are hanging off of leather. And yeah. Like, you're picking them up by their tail and this piece of leather and slapping them on the table and pushing them around. And they're just so enthralled with that mm -hmm. game that it means the world to them. So chances are if you went and bought one of these dogs and you didn't do anything with it for a year, a year and a half, and then you call me, chances are it's going to be really, really difficult to bring that out in him. To recover it. Yeah, it's going to be really hard. So your advice would be if somebody who truly wants a personal protection dog to either buy one already trained or buy, yeah. start it as a puppy. Buy Get it from the trained, right breeder. And from the right breeder yeah. and make sure you know what you're selecting. Like. I see that a lot, you know, too. They're like, sure. I got a Malinois, and then you look at, like, the breeder, and you're like, oh, they breed show Malinois, yeah. which is the or opposite of what The biggest one want. is show German Shepherds. So yeah. there's a really a huge defined line, kind of black and white, within the breeding community of German Shepherds. Either you're breeding for show or you're breeding for work, and there's a huge difference oh, yeah. in the two. Oh, yeah. A huge difference but in the two. But the problem is, as we all know, is a lot of people don't know that. 
It's and, education. That's why we do the show, yeah, brother. Yeah, education. Yeah. And there's a lot of, as we've discussed in a few episodes, there's a lot of not so good breeders out there that won't tell you. They won't tell yeah. you this is a show line. They won't ask you why you want a German Shepherd. Yeah. Um, so they'll just go get a $500 German Shepherd from, you know, John down the street and assume in their mind that because it's a Shepherd, I'm going to get this to be a personal protection dog. Well, now they're stuck with a, a, a German Shepherd for 10 plus years uh, for, do for a reason that they didn't get them. Yeah, exactly. you know, exactly. Like everybody knows, like has been to my house. I think everybody sitting in here knows or at least seen a video like my chocolate lab female. Oh, bites, yeah. She launches. Yeah. She's a beast. Oh, she yeah. hits you like she doesn't care. Do I think that she would bite somebody for real in a real instance? No, I don't. But. We built her from a younger age into this driven, just psychotic lab, um, and now she does it. Mountain was over at the house, you know, a few weeks ago, and I was like, "You want to catch a lab?" He's like, <laughs> "Yeah, why not?" <laughs> of course. So uh, we throw we throw her on him, and like she's a she's a tank. Yeah. And do you bring her with you up here? No, no, oh, you should have. She's uh, my wife's cuddle buddy. Oh yeah. Right now, so it'd have been cool to catch her. To catch yeah. a lab. To catch a lab. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I just saw it when I was out uh, the decoy workshop that you held at yeah, your house. Yeah. yeah, I saw him uh, throw on the sleeve and do some catches with the yeah. labs. How much does does she weigh? She's about fifty five pounds. She's, oh wow, a little squirrely one. Yeah, yeah. that's funny, yeah. man. She's got that mal look in her eyes though. Yeah, yeah. It's that crazy cracked out. Mal and look. and Mountain has a new passion for catching dogs as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Tell us about tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with which. Uh, what you've kind of tapped into here. So basically it all started kind of uh, with uh, Morgan's dog, Kuno, and everything that she taught him and kind of showing me the game. And then as it kind of became more prevalent in the company and Jake put out that, that uh, seminar in October, went out there and learned some things. And um, I just kind of got bit by the bug, so to speak. Yeah, man. You know? it's hard. And so now I'm just, I kind of do Cody's traveling gypsy truck thing. And, I, you know, I've been down in North Carolina to work with Will. I went out to tennessee to go see uh, jake and stay with him for a while and learn some stuff and it's just one of those things that's slowly becoming an obsession um i still i think i agree with jake when it comes to like the odor side of things it's really a lot of fun to kind of pick apart a dog and see their brain kind of kick into that next gear and, and solve that puzzle and and do these amazing things that you literally could not do without a dog like yeah. you spent billions of dollars billions. trying to figure out a machine that can smell as well and you, you can't so yeah. um but the protection stuff, it's just, it's awesome to see so much violence. And if you have a good dog, it's completely controlled. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the beautiful thing. As controlled Desiree chaos. Joyce says, love and violence. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> controlled violence. I love it. It's that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. And I know you, uh, I know this is like this, you're so passionate about this stuff. And I yeah. think, I think it's great, man. It's awesome. I love it too. Yeah. Um, I packed my bike suit specifically. Just to catch well, you. He, he's in the back of the truck. He's so. ready. He's ready to go. He's I had no other intention behind bringing that. Maybe we'll do him. a live yeah, after this. We'll do, do a live uh, Facebook live and do show uh, Jacob. It's doing becoming some a new thing of the show now. Yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah, suit up for after. D two after after the show. the show. Everyone suit up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll do a live catch with uh, Jacob and uh, Joe's dog D two uh, Malinois as well. So yeah. Then uh, now let me ask you real quick. Yep. I don't mean to cut you off. Going back to the tracking guys. Yep. Or actually both, tracking and personal protection. It's a good question we had. Do you have a preference on male or female? I think males are more readily available within the working community than females are. Um, honest to God, one of my favorite dogs ever, um, out of every dog that I've ever trained, is a female. She's probably my second, third favorite. We'll put that in perspective of th trained thousands of dogs, and she's wow. she's up there. She is a... She's a social butterfly, but when you turn that bitch on, she's on. It's game on, and she got a nose like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> like she just, she's on it. Tracking, amazing. Odor detection, amazing. And bite work, yeah, is just off the chart. Nice. And what is, what was she? A male. She's a, male. a female male. Yeah, that's awesome. What, what I was gonna say, what do you? I, I would say females. I feel like females get distracted by a lot less. Um, and you know they don't act like idiots just because there's another female in heat, and, and then you gotta like refocus. And obviously you can train the males out of that, but I think just naturally, you know the females. I mean they go crazy when they go in heat, and that's like the kind yeah. of craziness that they put onto that bite, and it's just controlled, and you don't 
you don't have to deal with like all the extraneous bullshit of trying to train them out of all those distractions. I mean, yes, there are certain ones that do, but I, I feel like they're a little bit more focused of dogs than the males are sometimes. Nick, yeah. you have a preference? No, I feel like I've seen a lot of good boat for both. I've seen some legit females in tracking detection, protection. I mean, I saw one of Bob's um, when I was out there, a female. Um, that Wika one that you took a bite from at Jake's. Oh, the Brazilian, Wika! The Brazilians yeah. brought down, and she was pregnant. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah, she, she was, was pregnant, legit. And she's yeah. still just yeah, she was smashing legit. Gorgeous, yeah. too. Oh, my God. Yeah, she was beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I would almost say that I don't think it matters. Yeah. I think it's very individual dog dependent, and so I don't I was, think it matters whether it's a male or a female. I wouldn't say it matters as much as, like, what's available. Yeah. What's a, you see more males available than females. That was, I was going to steal a line from Cody and say, just put the dog in front of me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. every yeah. dog is different. He doesn't look at breeds, and I, I can yeah. say that I never look at I, – I really don't. I, I don't ever look at uh, genders of the dog. Um they're all gender gender neutral to me. Yeah. <laughs> that a boy. Gender yeah. binary. Poli- it's the new politically correct <laughs> yeah. Joe, right? Yeah. There you go. Welcome. <laughs> um, what, what do you think about uh, from a protection perspective, Jacob? What did you, what's your experience with uh, neutered or non neutered? Uh, good question. Uh, so a lot of people, I think, get that persona of like, hey, go neuter your dog because it's going to calm them down, or it's going to do this, or it's going to do that. I relate that to if I went and got neutered. A vasectomy. Well, I did get neutered. My wife took me to get me neutered, but <laughs> it didn't change who I was. You know what I mean? That, like, you, I'm still, that you think. That I, that I think. We, we need to start. I heard Jacob soft lately. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, if, we, if we keep talking about this, he's going to start crying. Yeah. <laughs> so funny, funny story. We, we go to get that done, and uh, we walk in there, and I was like, you fucking lied to me. You told me you were getting ice cream. <laughs> so That's I literally funny. did that. It was hilarious. Um, but no, it doesn't change who you are. You are who you are. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so, but would you say, let me, to kind of clarify, would you say that it doesn't matter if you do it after a certain age? Cause what if you took that Mao and neutered at three months? Do you think so that I've would seen, have mattered before he was fully developed? In I've seen him come out. Of, I've seen him come out of Europe that, you know, they were, let's say crypt orchid and no, they never, they have never descended. So they had to go in and cut them out. So if they were crypt orchid and they, at a young age and they never dropped then they go ahead and they take them out because they can they shrivel up they become can't they can become cancerous or high risk so generally speaking they'll just go and cut them out and i've seen them come out of europe at you know 12 months old just rearing and ready to go so i don't i I would be curious to know if you neutered it at like three months or something if that would affect the drive and i mean i guess it could but we look at because you're you're saying a vasectomy at this age that we are now we're adults but what if you like you know, gave your five-year-old son a vasectomy. Don't you think that that would have some, like, maybe some development yeah, drive some development issues yeah. and, stuff, and stuff like so. that and stuff probably? But we look at it too. Is like dogs are born with certain drives and instincts, and it's all it relates back to genetics and the way that they were bred and certain things like that. So they're born with certain drives and instincts. And you can only enhance or diminish. You can't take away. Correct. So there's a certain genetic makeup that they have. I can either enhance or I can diminish. So, which are you doing as raising the dog? I don't think necessarily removing their testicles or spaying them or something of that nature is ultimately going to be a huge factor in that. And I think the whole spay neuter thing has gotten you know pushed because well, it's a political so many, thing. At yeah, this there's point. so many dogs in shelters, and nobody yeah. wants to see that. So they push the so the spay and the neuter, especially at a young age, just so it never has that ability to do that. Um, and I'm not opposed to spay or neuter at a young age. If you never plan on breeding that dog, if that's your decision, then do it, obviously, because you don't want an accidental breeding yeah. to happen, and you're trying to be a responsible pet owner. At the same time, if you think when you buy that dog that maybe down the line you might want to breed it, then don't like, don't like neuter it, and I'm perfectly okay with you there, too. So would your official answer be if I'm – because we, we've had this a lot. Um, like, oh, I want to do bite work with this, like, Mao or wh- whatever – shepherd rot whatever insert any breed but uh so i don't want to get them neutered do you think that is just bullshit that's bullshit okay so it has no so your official answer is neutering has no bearing has, on i would say it has no bearing and i would say if it did there have you bearing, go. it would be a very very small not enough percentage. for you to notice the difference yeah okay yeah. I think it's about responsible pet ownership. Yeah. Basically. Why do you neuter your dog? Like you said, it's about the, yeah. That's all it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. The overpopulation. But guess what? If your dog has obedience and a recall, and you've got a fence, chances are. 
you don't yeah. have to worry about that issue ever so why do it yeah so like both my male and my female aren't neither one spayed or neutered what are your thoughts on that on what fixing um i mean i don't think it really matters i don't i don't i like my mouth's neutered like i got him neutered when he's a little over a year old um it but de- it definitely didn't affect his. No, drive. I mean he's ten years old now, yeah. and he's fucking still tears around the yard like he's a one-year-old puppy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it had zero effect on any of his drive. So, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's just one of those things where. But we also have a female dog, um, so yeah, I think it's one of those things. If you even have a male and a female, and you're just very a good pet owner, and you know you're keeping them separated at the and right Layla's time, fixed, and stuff. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't. I don't think it matters that much. I've always. I actually have a blog on that where, and we get that even with uh, to get away from the uh, protection stuff for a little bit. I'm sure you've heard that. We've had owners write in, and they're like, "Oh, my dog's super dog aggressive," or he. Yeah, that's the. He he has all these issues, so you know we were thinking about training, but we're just gonna get him fixed yeah, first. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I've learned that generally it doesn't matter even for that. I talked to I talked to a client a while back, and they said, "Hey, well, we're gonna get him neutered first. I said, "Why are you?" And they said, "Because he's having all these issues." And I said, why don't you try to get him in earlier and then neuter him after? after yeah. And I've, then she's like, well, I think the neutering will call. And I talked to her about, about it. About the same ended, thing, yeah. She I, ended up signing up. So I do feel like one of the biggest reasons to neuter your dog, your male dog, earlier rather than later is the marking. Like, it just in yeah. my experience, like, you – I've never – because I've always gotten my dogs neutered as soon as possible just because yeah. I don't plan on fucking breeding them, right? Yeah. Um. And I've literally never had a marking issue. Yeah, you won't. Um, but I've gotten two older dogs that got neutered later on in their lives, and both of them had marking issues. I would definitely say that that is a fair assessment. I would say that most, if you got neutered as a puppy, then you're not going to run around marking on everything. And that's, a, like, just for a normal pet owner, like, that can be the biggest pain in the ass. Oh, yeah, like, you you limit where you can take your dog. Like, yeah. you can't take your dog into fucking Lowe's because he's going to piss on, or... on everything he sees, yeah. you know? And, and that's another thing, too, though, is that I see that that's definitely a fixable issue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying before training and all yeah. that stuff. But, you know, he that's one of the big things is you, you know can, you can definitely mitigate it by getting neutered at a younger age absolutely yeah before it starts before it ever starts and then once it starts it doesn't matter you got to you got to do training at yeah. that point there's yeah. no questions asked. even if you neuter them after yeah it, started, it doesn't matter still gonna the do habits it. already formed yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure um now talk to me about the downsides you think of a regular pet owner doing tracking and trailing are there any none I would I say I, don't, I mean what I would say you in say, in any capacity. I don't think there's I mean my I I guess I'll start off my personal opinion is I don't think there's any downside. It's like what's the downside for my dog doing nose work or like what's the downside of my dog doing obedience? I just don't feel like there's any downside. Well, I know it's great for confidence building, it's great for mental and physical stimulation, it's great for bonding with your dog, so I think it's conducive to all things that sure. create a happy dog. They're mentally exercised, they're physically exercised, they're they're using their mind. They're mentally exercised. They're out bonding. Um, so I would say there's no downside. I would say that I would agree with you, except for the fact that Joe you're, always has to disagree. If, well, <laughs> no, you'll hear me out. If you're doing man tracking, you you have to rely on another person. Like that's kind of the for pet owners that can't. That's sometimes a downside because not your husband's not always available. Your buddy's not always available. That's no. why we should start a tracking club. There you go. I've actually gotten a lot of uh, questions about that. Let's do it. I'm down. I'm so nice. then it eliminates the only downside that you say an owner would have. Bam. Look at that. You, you got know. problems. I got solutions. There you go. Bam. Yeah. Oh, Mountain, oh, any oh, downside that oh, you've okay, seen? Man. If it's a, from a pet perspective or a pet owner perspective, I don't think there's really any downside. Um, it's just obviously like if there's an intended goal um, – you know, I've got a couple of clients that are retirees and they want to eventually like volunteer their services to local search and rescue yeah. or this, that, and the other. So, you know, if it's, hey, two weeks between our sessions and you've got homework to do with your dog, but you've been doing it incorrectly the entire time, now we're 13 steps backwards because we've got to fix that problem before we can, you know, yeah. progress again. So, like I said, from a pet perspective, I don't think there's any issue. Go in the woods, kick up some dust, have some fun. 
um, you know, reward your dog and, and you guys will both go home happy and tired and, and live out your lives. But if it's for a purpose, if it's literally something that you're doing because in your spare time you want to help people by finding their pets or help lost yeah. kids or whatever, I think there can definitely be some issues with training um, because it's so autonomous to the company as far as like, oh, we meet once a week or once every two weeks and now they can lay some poor foundation or groundwork when they're home and unsupervised. Yeah, that's deep. Jacob? I don't say there's a downside to obviously signing your dog up for a program that's only going to benefit him, you know, exercise why. Uh, I see the only like downside honestly would be trying to get it to transfer from so if you take somebody who's never tracked in their yeah. entire life and trying to teach it to them like Mountain said like they might fuck mess some up, stuff yeah. up. Yeah. So they're going to mess some things up and you could cause you to go back and forth, you know, a little bit. But that's why it's um, called training and too. trying to fix it. So <laughs> that would be the only one, but honestly I think like just like everybody else said like 90 99 percent of dogs could probably do it to some extent yeah and there's just no way you're no, gonna physically harm the dog yeah you're not yeah. Gonna you know what i mean it's not like bite work where you can harm a dog if you don't know what you're yeah, doing just know your dog's capability and expect so if you're going to go take your english bulldog and sign them for tracking just know that you're probably not going to get much further than 20 yards versus <laughs> if you go to track your you know german shepherd you probably have a lot of fun and getting out in the woods get some and miles doing in. get some miles in and stuff like that it would be a blast, you know. And and I can't really speak for other training companies because I haven't looked up their programs on on the, the cost of them. But I know for off leash, it's really not that expensive. No, it's like if, cheap, yeah. if you want to do lessons, like it's not going to cost you a whole lot. And, and it's private lessons. And they're private. Yeah. And your dog's going to learn a ton of shit. And so are you. And so will and you. Have fun. And have fun in the process. I actually so. thought of another downside. Uh, for uh, <laughs> always got to disagree with yourself, huh? <laughs> I always try to be devil's advocate in everything. I'm fair and unba- and not unbalanced, unbiased. Yeah. Maybe unbalanced a little bit. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> unbalanced, that's for but, sure. Uh, <laughs> but one of the downsides I find that you can get into is uh, being like Joe Zitzelberger and getting super fucking emotional and heated when your dog doesn't find the person. That's so. completely <laughs> oh, inaccurate there. That's the one thing I preach to my clients. Yeah, Joe preaches it to to his clients i'll give him that credit but uh, sean's on the soundboard sean does joe uh preach it and follow the, his own advice sean's shaking his head am i no. missing something <laughs> joe always tells the clients he's like look if your dog doesn't find it like that's why we're here we're trained you like, motherfucker yeah he, he's like you can't get emotional about it like you just put him up and you know pull him out a little bit later yeah, and try so again. we started uh yesterday we started trying to track with my dog <laughs> It did not go very well. And you remained unemotional, I assume? I heard, yeah. <laughs> on the outside. On the outside. But literally, Joe will tell his clients that, and then, like, we'll do a track with Joe's dog, and his dog is really fucking good at it. But every now and then, you know, it's a dog. Sure. Like, they'll miss it. Like, some shit happens. And I'm like, this motherfucker, like, <laughs> get your ass in the fucking you're, kennel. You're not eating for six days. Yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm well, kidding. Well, Welcome to the ASPCA. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he tells all his clients, like, don't get emotional. And then well, like, and I, and he just, like, loses his Well, mind. and I do tell him that because it's important. It's very important. And, yeah. and it happens to everything trainers. Travels. You know it's what I mean? It's hard not to when it's it your really, dog. It, you know? It's yeah. really super well, hard. everything travels down least, so you got to really leave emotion at the door. Yeah. 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 Like, no to. doubt. My, the trainers, when we were in Pennsylvania, same, like, I kept stressing that. Because, you know, they were literally learning like never done it before in their lives today is like day one day two they're missing some tracks here and there and yeah. they're like i don't understand i thought they'd be so good at you know like, yeah. i'm like calm down yeah, this relax. is like their third <laughs> rep ever yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're 12 minutes in guys yeah. let's let's relax a little bit so that's bit. one downside is you can get super emotional yeah i like, yeah, the, I like totally the opposite true. when they're like super confident and the dog uh, i yeah. had one so I had a black lab, and we went to Leeselvania State Park, and we used the trails. And so we would start on a trail and then just cut into the woods and start doing the fire trails. Sure. And uh, the woman's like, yeah, he loves it, and he, he loves his ball so much. And He's going to be so a savage. Be, yeah. So this dog, <laughs> we would literally walk up the trail. I'd set a fire trail off the actual path, so like into the, the brush and the, the, the grass. And the moment she would give him the command to search, the dog would take a few steps. As soon as it got off like the well-beaten path, it just stopped. Uh. and it refused to go into the tree line and so literally the dog i I pulled out of the the path and then we went basically on the tree line that skirts the road so now he's just tracking in short grass and then i pop in behind a tree in the tree line and this dog would track the trail go all the way down and then sit parallel with me and just look at me (laughs) behind a tree and be like i'm not coming in there motherfucker (laughs) and he refused to go into the woods and so i asked the lady and apparently she lives on like you know decent property and she lets the dog kind of free roam and so, you know, I asked her, I was like, have you ever thought about, have, has your dog ever gotten hit by like a raccoon or a fox out there or gotten into a scuffle with some wildlife? 
and possibly created an aversion to going into the bush. And she's like, well, you know, sometimes he comes back with scrapes and this and that. And I was like, yeah, this dude's got PTSD from the woods. <laughs> oh, so he didn't want to go in. So it took us a little while, and, and we broke him of it. But uh, it was it was a lot more confidence building of that yeah. dog getting into the actual sticks. He had no problem putting nose to the ground falling odor, but it was just like, dude, there's snakes Once in there. I'm not the... going. In and overconfidence will translate into emotions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I could definitely see that. Um, again, as you were saying, especially if it's your personal dog. Yeah. You've put so much time and work into this, and you finally get out. and, and All your friends are there to watch all your, your epic dog. Are watching, <laughs> and you're like, all right, motherfucker. You're like, you guys, and that's Joe, too, because Joe like knows his dog's good. So. <laughs> So Joe will be like, "Oh, you guys want to see a fucking track? All right, like come watch this shit." <laughs> and then beast, his dog though. misses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is a beast. He is though. a beast. Yeah, but he does. He, I mean, he does miss, and every uh, dog will. Yeah, yeah. and um, you know, it, it it's about learning from it and figuring out why. Yeah, yeah. miss ninety nine shots. He doesn't want to give up because he knows <laughs> Joe gets pissed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get animal control called on me after this show. I guarantee it. Um, so to kind of sum things up, I feel like. One, I think we all agree that tracking for any pet owner is fine. Just yeah. understand uh, what you're doing and how the capabilities of your specific dog and you, really. Yeah, you need to be an active person. Yep. And then two, depending on how far you want to take it, kind of will depend on the level of training that you need. Right. Yeah. Correct. Right? I mean, because, yeah, we do, uh, like, the trees, vegetation, and then, like, more advanced tracking and trailing, like, urban like shopping centers and, and that's, that's where nerve natural yeah. nerves come into play right jacob yeah. i mean yeah, i know cool. you're big on nerves yeah. uh, with dogs and, and lack thereof but i mean if if you're if you have a dog that you want to uh join a private contracting company uh, for search and rescue or whatever and your dog's nervy as shit no yeah. matter how good it is in the woods with zero distractions yeah, yeah. you probably won't get that yeah. contract no right? you're not going to get it no 100 yeah. percent of the time environmentals play a key in everything that you know dogs do so even like your household stereotypical pet like how many times do we get them that they're unsocialized we take them out in the environment and we have to work them through that yeah. yeah and teach them that confidence that hey this is okay and the same thing transpires in the working dog realm like if your dog does amazing at your house and like he bites and he does you know whatever here in this controlled environment and then you take him out somewhere that's not known to him outside of his ordinary you know, everyday kind of ventures. He's and he doesn't work. He's just not environmentally sound, and that's not necessarily a dog that I would want. Yeah. So, and then the nerves come into it as well. They just have to be confident in their, you know, their environment. There's a ton of dogs that get scared by loud noises, and they could be good in their environment, but all of a sudden, like that one loud noise and gets them spooked. Yeah. So, it's just exposing them to everything that you possibly can at a young age, and that's why all of us preach socialization at and environmental. Yeah. Is as soon as you get that puppy, take him, take him everywhere. Mountain, any age limit to starting tracking with the dog? I've had, I think my oldest tracking dog was been eight years old. And I mean, start him as soon as you get yeah, him, six start, weeks old. Yeah, yeah, I mean, start him as soon as you, <laughs> you can, get him. right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I haven't found a limit yet. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, I, and I haven't come across it personally, but just that old crotchety dog that's just like, I want to sit on the couch and watch TV. Yeah. All. Yeah. But then again, it also comes to being that pet owner. Has that been what your dog has done its entire life? Yeah. So clearly, if it's an indoor German Shepherd that never goes out, but maybe to a family barbecue once a year, then obviously that dog doesn't <laughs> want to go get icky in the woods. Yeah, you know for I mean? sure. I've legit, so. Sam, I know you have, but I've legit seen like 10 week old dogs like legit at tracking and super legit like for being 10 weeks old at detection yeah. like yeah. sitting on odor ignoring distractor oh, yeah. odors like just oh, killing yeah. it yeah, yeah. like pat nolan uh up in maryland like yeah he does some really cool shit with like eight 10 week old that puppies legendary yeah puppies and i mean he's legendary with like he'll make a 10 week old puppy look like a two year old detection now. Yeah. like yeah. boom watch like, one of his videos yeah. where he was like teaching this little 11 week old lab puppy to place and it was just like back and forth, back and forth. That dude's got a mind. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who, who is that? Pat, Pat Nolan. Nolan. Oh, okay. Man. Old uh, Ponderosa Kennels. Yep. I think yeah. It is. Old bird dog guy, man. He yeah. started like way back in the 70s. Like man, the George Hickok yeah. Uh, yeah. era. Yeah. yeah. So you seen? I think his name is Mike Mike Settle out of Logan Hall. Oh yeah, Mike's he's Settle. a beast yeah. too, man. Yeah. With, yeah. with his little eight week old Patterdale Terrier, free shaping. Out there and yeah, stuff. And he's yeah. got discriminating odors. He's got bacon and kibble and all that Dude, stuff. Dude, he's yeah. a beast. He's just... a beast with detection. Well, so yeah. a lot of times with those, like for specific like diabetic alert, I've heard some companies start 
at a very, very young age with puppies, just getting them to smell it, reward, smell it, reward, so that it's something that's ingrained Impressive. at a very, very, very it's like young classical age. like conditioning, essentially. Yeah. yeah. So, a... And I've heard of other people, like, you know, putting towels of odor with, you know, with the dog's food, so it starts associating as young as, yep. like, when they start eating kibble for the very first time at, like, six weeks. We actually, you know? with the board and train, told you to do that. I think, I forget, because the dog, I, um, same, like, take a... Uh, uh, a styrofoam bowl and then put the odor inside of that styrofoam bowl and then have another styrofoam bowl with like holes yeah. poked in and put the food in there Associate. and then set that in there yeah. so as the every time the dog's eating he's Imprinting. smelling the odor yeah. coming up and yeah. just every time you feed him do now that, that now, and now that it's just like his olfactory. ingrained yeah every time that cues his olfactory now it means food yeah so that odor means food and it's just ingrained yeah. like imagine yeah. if every meal you ate your entire life like you smelled cinnamon yeah. or something you know it's like all of a sudden a cinnamon hits you you're like where yeah. is it you yeah. know Where's so so yeah so well then i guess that's why we as humans get excited when we walk into a kitchen of good food cooking you yeah, know like pizza it. when uh jacob was yeah. baking some pizza yesterday yes. at my house we got oh. super excited oh, so. have idea. <laughs> what time was that uh like two eight one <laughs> i was gonna say did you guys party last night <laughs> no we were just hanging out just having hanging some out. pizza talking yeah. dogs and yeah, stuff talking dogs i hear you cool nick anything else to add to the tracking no portion? it's a lot of fun like i said we're gonna do probably another one today um and uh yeah i feel like that's a, a good summary pretty much any dog i feel like can do it eight weeks to 15 yeah. years old yeah. essentially um, yeah so essentially look up you know tracking programs trainers in yeah, if your you guys area. are in virginia we actually have a website called dog tracking virginia.com dog tracking virginia.com and that's our website and it lists our different tracking programs if you're outside of virginia um just email us and we can probably put you in touch with someone if you're interested in it yeah, yeah. for sure info at off leash canine training.com um appreciate you guys coming on today Thanks yeah for definitely a lot of knowledge between between you two and are we so. still going to do a, a live bite with jacob yeah um, if, if jacob's um, down diesel's if, ready if jacob isn't scared yeah. diesel's been napping for an hour and a half so he's ready to go attack dogs scare me oh uh, here we go you need the gauntlets yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, a couple of things real quick i want to thank uh a couple more of our sponsors for today's show uh, DemonAbitesuits.com. Uh, Chris is the owner. Check them out on Facebook and their website. Uh, super great guy. Super great company. By far my uh, personal yeah. um, opinion of uh, being the best suits out there. Literally everyone I know uses them. Yeah. Yeah. Literally everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they they are they are really good. And then um, you can get ten percent off your bite suit orders on their website by using discount code Dog Show. And then, of course, Flower of Life CBD. This is their pet CBD, which I use on my dogs, and Nick uses on his dogs. I do, indeed. And we are big, big believers. I'm going to save. You remember we were talking about the big test for me was the flight to Vegas. Oh, yeah. What, what happened? We're going to need a little bit more. Oh, you didn't do it? No, no, no. I did oh. it. We're going to need a good 15, 20 minutes for that story. So we're going to save that one for the okay. next episode. All right. Uh, definitely an interesting and embarrassing story <laughs> to say the least. Um, I actually debated even talking about it, but fuck it. Well, now you, you know, who cares? Yeah, you have to. So, so we'll bring that up next week, uh, on that show, but definitely check these guys out. They have human products, animal products. Uh, we're big advocates for it. It's folcbd.com. Use uh, discount code dog show as well, um, for 10% off of their entire site. And then of course, if you missed it earlier, whistle.com is now a sponsor of the show, pet GPS awesome. collars. And uh, you can, the collars are seventy nine ninety nine on their website. You can use discount code, guess what guys? Dog, dog show. show. Dog show. <laughs> uh, for 15 bucks off. So it comes all the way down to 64-ish dollars. Did I do that math right? Yeah, 65. $65. So um, again, discount code dogshowwhistle.com. Uh, again, thank you to these guys. Thank you to Sean for hitting the boards. My man, Nick White. Uh, are you in town next week? I am in town until the first week of April. That's when I go and do the Cody Garbrandt seminar in California. Man, I'm super jealous about that one. So, yeah, you are in town next week for the yep. next show. So we're excited uh, to uh, bring you episode 12 next week. You guys can download the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify now. 
uh, Alexa, that little girl, is telling us uh, that you can uh, play our podcast. Oh, really? You oh, can play yeah. It on Alexa? Yep. I'm going to yep. have to test Actually, that. Actually, and I have the Google Home yeah. at home, and that plays the podcast <laughs> really? as well. So, so what do you say? Like, Alexa, play the dog show with Nick and Joe. Yes. Really? She's probably playing right out there That's right now that she said that. That's yep. pretty awesome. Yep. In Google Home, you go, okay, Google, play the dog show. So anyhow, awesome. so you can pretty much anywhere you can uh, download a pod- YouTube, podcast. YouTube, it's on. Yeah, it's on yeah, YouTube everywhere. everywhere yeah. So um again thank you to our listeners and our viewers special shout out to uh, mos mos tv check and them out on facebook yeah absolutely check them out on facebook and uh, bite ranch academy um nick morrow at Bar- uh, bite ranch bite ranch absolutely so we will uh we'll see everybody next week right all right later guys